Welcome to this Getting Started tutorial for the Erica Synths LXR02 drum machine. This is not a video about all the wonderful sounds you can get out of it. It's about making the early days with the machine as easy and productive as possible, rather than frustrating. So, we won't be looking at the sounds, just basic operations to get going, like making a pattern, changing sounds, saving, loading, and some initial configurations. Just a quick note on the build. It's all metal, it's the exact same size and build as the DB01, it's got the same T34 sloping front armour, same buttons, and uh, there's also a degree of commonality between them in terms of operation, which makes the path a little bit easier if you're a DB01 owner. We'll switch on, you'll see the firmware version come up in the bottom right corner very briefly. 1.1 loading kits from SD card. Now, if you don't see that, you'll probably see SD error no card. And uh, that means you've forgotten to insert the little SD card, micro SD card at the back. It's rather cunning in that if you miss the SD error no card message, it will otherwise continue loading and look perfectly normal. But without the card, it's a bit of a zombie machine. So a moment of sympathy for anyone who's gone down that road because it'll look normal, but you won't get a single sound out of it. So the firmware and all the patterns, preferences and kits come from the card. That has the benefit of making the firmware updates and kit management pretty easy because you can just do it directly on the card on a computer by rearranging the files. The data structure, very briefly, 64 projects. Each project 64 kits with 64 patterns, and those 64 patterns can be combined into 64 songs. So uh, that's more than 4,000 patterns, songs, 4,000 kits. And if you really want more, you could just image another little micro SD card. So I don't think capacity will ever be an issue with the LXR02. So what is a project? It's just a collection of patterns, preferences, and kits. The two main things about projects is that a lot of the configuration defaults are stored per project. The other important fact is that when it comes to saving stuff, you have to save the project. There's no auto-save and no option to auto-save. It's all up to you. So we booted it up. We saw that we had version 1.1, the screensaver has kicked in already. It sort of looks like a, uh, you know, a bit like something's gone terribly wrong to me, but um, that's the screensaver. Now the machine boots to pattern one in project zero. Press play to start the pattern. Press play again and it stops. It doesn't pause. It just stops and resets then from the start of the pattern again. Now, at this point, we could zoom on and talk about uh, kits and sounds and patterns and things like that, but it's right at this exact moment that it's very easy as a new user to get lost. And the quick way to get lost is to either accidentally or via initial pokings around, change modes. There's two basic modes to the machine. There's voice mode and performance mode. And depending on where you are, uh, or which mode you're in, it's quite profoundly different. Some of the controls change, so we sort of need to get that out of the way pretty quick. In this little section of four buttons here, we've got load and save, which is uh, pretty clear. In performance, it's uh, mainly for sort of broad play adjustments. Now in the display here, you'll see this little arrow. And that arrow shows that there's more parameters to see. So let's have a look. SHU, well, there's a lot of uh, three-letter acronyms in the LXR. SHU stands for shuffle. It's shuffle amount. You can adjust it here. Little arrow there. So we turn the dial to the left and we're back here. SRT is sample rate. So... If we take it down, that's like a global bit crusher amount. 
MRP is morph amount and we'll save that for the next video because there's plenty to cover in this ROL is roll it's the auto roll rate so for example and sometimes it doesn't kick in straight away and it hasn't here so to activate it we'll just give it a knob a little twiddle now so there's the six sounds And there's the roll amount, which we can then change. That is roll. Now, we'll come back to this in a second, specifically the one function there. But for now, BPM. Fairly obvious what that is. It goes up to 255. You can take it all the way down to incredibly slow amount and you might say why would you ever want to get down to that sort of speed well who knows you might be doing all sorts of crazy things but the main thing is if you get down to zero it goes to ext which is external meaning now that you will pick up an external clock i've got a midi cable here which has an external clock so now if I press play, I'm picking up the external clock speed, which is 90 BPM. Now, the other nice thing about syncing to an external clock is if you have a DB01, they will react in exactly the same way to an external clock, an external MIDI clock in terms of uh, stopping, starting, resetting, so they will be beautifully synchronized. So we're still in performance mode, but let's have some instant sound gratification and load some other kits. You notice the button here, mark kit. We've got load, press and hold load, press kit. This is the kit we're currently on, kit number zero. Out of the 64 kits in this project, turn this little data knob and you see the different kits if you find one you think you like press the data button in press play go to the next one and so on and you can go through the various kits And that's loading kits. One of the things you might like to know when you're loading these kits is, well, yes, this New York kit, well, it sounds all right, but I sort of like to play the individual sounds. How can you do that? Well, in performance mode, you might sort of think you could play it here because this is labeled drum one, two, three, snare, clap, closed hat, open hat. And it's a little bit off-putting that you can't do that. You might even go here and you think, oh, can I do that? But no, now you're adding steps to the pattern. So what to do? It's all under the roll function here. So if we take it back until we see it, say, 1. Because when we were here, you remember, we had roll 16. And you can change it to various things. But if we go all the way down to one, now we can actually play it. And that's the way you play individual sounds. Now the thing about the roll function is it doesn't work if the pattern stopped. You can't do any of these sound playing in voice mode. Roll only works when it's going. So it does make it a little bit hard just to preview individual sounds. You've got to be in performance mode and the roll function has got to be on one. The workaround, or perhaps better term, the solution for this problem is to use an external MIDI controller, in which case the individual hits will work in both modes, in performance mode and voice mode. And you can keep the roll function going. So for example, 
I'll go there. I've got it via the MIDI cable there. I've got it hooked up to an external keyboard and you can see the sounds being triggered there. And we could play it. We could get this rolling. And we could still play it. So um, if you've got it hooked up to an external controller, that's a reasonable solution. Now the other big difference between performance mode and voice mode is that in performance mode, the buttons here on the voices act as mutes. Whereas in voice mode, it's a way to select that voice for editing. So pretty fundamental difference there as well. Now one other thing about these two modes, voice mode and performance mode, and that is if you go exploring in various other configurations or different parameters, pressing either or both of these buttons will usually sort of work a bit like an escape key. It'll get you out of whatever it is that you're doing and you'll be back into performance mode or voice mode. So that can be useful to remember as well. Let's resume with the voice mode. That's where you are when you first boot up and that's where you'll want to be most of the time when you're editing and playing sounds. If you wanted to go nuts with sounds right away, all those eight buttons across here have access to a different page of parameters. So choose a voice, press a button and see a somewhat arcane acronym about what those various parameters might be. Now sometimes you'll see a little arrow come up, like there, that means there's more parameters to see, so you can reveal those by pressing that button again from that particular page. Press it again to toggle from page to page. As well as using these four knobs, you could also use the data knob. So if we turn the data knob, you'll see that the parameter is capitalized, the currently selected one. When it gets to the end, where there's another page of parameters, you just keep on turning. Now we're on to the next page. Get to the end, go back again. And if you want to keep using the data knob for uh, data entry, you just press it. Now we've got the amount. So you just turn it and to get back again, press it again. So why would you want to use the data knob instead of these four knobs? And the answer is, well, in some modes you need to use the data knob. Not very many, usually it's a couple of the modes down here rather than any of this stuff. Um, the other reason is that the data knob tends to be a lot finer in its adjustments so it's a lot slower to change the values whereas if you use this well in this one say you can very quickly zoom up to the maximum value whereas if you use the data knob it's a lot slower but that's the main difference now as you select each one of those voices you can see down here the steps that have been activated. So if we wanted to change the pattern, basic editing in the usual way. Now also, you'll see the little labels underneath the voice buttons here, drum one, two, and three. One, two, and three share the same synth architecture, which means as you go through these parameters for drum one, drum two will have the same sort of parameters, drum three will have the same sort of parameters because they all are the same sort of drum synth engine. Get to snare, and the parameters are a bit different. Like, for example, there's no FM options on snare but there's options on other things then you've got clap symbol and closed hat and open hat you know the labels are really suggestions because there's more than 30 parameters per voice so they can really be just about anything you like the closed hat and open hat are a little bit different in that um, 
they're in a committed relationship, as you can tell by the little line here. So the hats share a voice and some parameters, but they each get their own track. So closed hat track, open hat track. Anyway, I'd go through the sound editing parameters in my next video, but very briefly to have a look at things. Oscillator. Amplitude envelope. Modulation. Frequency modulation. The uh, transient click amount, volume, frequency, and the little sampled waveform that you can use. Filter type with resonance and drive. And the LFO. Each of these voices has its own LFO, but the LFO doesn't have to remain committed to that voice. You could take the LFO from drum one, for example, and decide that that LFO should be assigned to voice number four. And likewise, you could say in voice number two, I'll have the LFO, well, you can see here, it's already assigned to voice six, but you could say, oh, I'll have it to voice four. So you could have all six LFOs pointing to one voice or any mixture or, you know, one on each or any mixture that you please, which makes the LFOs pretty amazingly effective, especially because there's so many different destinations you can have. So we come to the mix section, which is really like a sort of mini configuration section for each voice. So we'll go through the parameters. Volume, pretty self-evident from 0 to 127 to select the maximum value that you're going to see on the slider. Panning, which is relevant as long as you've got the outputs assigned to a stereo pair of some sort. Uh, sample rate, so if we press play, this is the sample rate reduction just for that particular voice. Likewise, DRV is drive just for that voice. We've got this one selected, so that's the drive for that. Press it again to get to the next page. The output. Now this is uh, pretty fundamentally important. This is which output the voice goes to. So you've got four outs which can be configured as two stereo pairs or one stereo pair, either one, and two mono outs or four mono outs. Um, the thing is most of the kits seem to have their outputs defaulted to stereo one, which is this first stereo pair here. I was tempted at first just to configure everything as four separate mono outs. It's a bit of a shame not to have a stereo pair out just because, as I mentioned before, the LFO is so lovely in the way it can pan things synchronized and um, you can have all sorts of very nice little stereo effects going on. So it's a shame not to have a stereo pair. Uh, the other thing is if depending on how you set things up in the door and if you don't get things exactly right then it'll think that it's going out sort of just the left side of a stereo pair or as a mono and uh, it can get pretty confusing pretty quickly if you haven't set this right and matched it up with the door so certainly the easiest thing by far well and you'll know that something's wrong because you'll start getting uh, usually much reduced volumes on some voices and you'll go, eh, what's going on? And it'll be because you might have had this pan to um, left two out or right one out or something like that, whereas in actual fact it was set in the door as stereo or it's set here as stereo but in the door it's mono. So best just to, I'm making it sound confusing, aren't I? Best just to keep this, I think, just as a simple stereo output because that's what a lot of the kits default to. And then when you want your separate outs, probably for the kick and something else, assign them here to separate monos. And then you can go, because this is um, left one, right one, left two, right two. And together this is ST1 stereo one or ST2 stereo two. So if you want that as a stereo pair, it's ST2. Otherwise, left one, right one, left two, right two. And uh, the other thing to know is that if you've got this, so we've got our 
kick drum now as right two, but we haven't got anything plugged into right two, but we'll play it anyway. Well, what's this? We're hearing it. Well, why is that possible when it's right two? And there it is left two. Well, we're sort of hearing it come out right and left, but we've only got the first stereo pair assigned, and that's because it will find, well now we've got it assigned to this stereo pair too, but as I say, we've only got stereo one with any cables in it, so what's going on? And the answer is, and geez, it confused the hell out of me at first, the answer is that it will find the nearest connected output. So you might assign something over here thinking, oh yeah, I'll connect something later, but for now I'll have nothing there. Um, oh no, it'll go, hey, I'm not going to be silenced, and it'll just leap across until it finds an output. So that's a trap for the unwary, so something really to be uh, mindful of. And this whole thing about what you assign as the stereo pair or the mono outs or whatever is probably something to really give some thought to when you're starting out with a machine so that when you're building kits and patterns and doing all the nice, um, you know, detailed work, um, you can have it all assigned properly from the start rather than halfway through going, oh, well, now I'd really like to separate the kick, but, you know, I've got it assigned here or there or whatever. So probably something in here to really have a think about early on. Anyway, so that is the output section. Length is an interesting one as well. Well, here is a 16-step length on the kick drum. Likewise, we can see all these voices are at 16 steps. But we can, for example, put the length of, let's say, the kick drum at 3. And now we see... It's a very easy way to get those polymeters happening. That's a beautiful little thing, I think. Channel is the channel of the voice, and every voice can have a different channel, which is very nice. And finally, note is the note that it's assigned to as an output. So if you want to play it on a connected MIDI keyboard, that is the note that it'll activate on. Now, strangely enough, you can see that these first two are assigned their own notes, B4 and D4, but then the rest of them are all on C4. And from what I can see, all the kits are assigned like that. I don't know why, it seems sort of strange, but there it is. Obviously, if you want to change it, it's simple enough to do. Just decide whatever note you want, and there it is. Now, since we're talking configuration, we might as well get hardcore and go into the main config section. The shift key here gets us into the secondary functions. The secondary functions are this sort of reverse text here on white. So the shift likewise is reverse, so shift config. Now we can see this is another way where we can get into BPM because you remember performance mode was where we could set BPM and it's on external because we've got the MIDI plugged in, but we can also get there via this config menu. And that's common to a few different functions on the LXR. There's more than one way to do the same thing. SHU is the global shuffle amount, so... CH is the global channel. SSV is the screensaver, so we can turn that screensaver off if we wanted to. Press on... Now, remember how I said that normally with these things, the four buttons here and the data knob are interchangeable. Now, we've got more parameters in this menu, but we can't get to it from these knobs. We can't press on config again to get there. This is the case where you've got to use the data knob. So you see it going across, capitalizing, screensaver off. And this is the second page. These are mostly MIDI um, parameters, which I'll save for a later MIDI video. MTX is MIDI transmit filtering. MRX 
is MIDI receive filtering. MRT is MIDI routing. And there's various options here for determining what well, what incoming MIDI goes to the DIN or USB outputs. FLW is follow, meaning if we've got multiple bars, will the pattern display chase along with those bars or would the display just stick on whatever bar you happen to have selected? Both have their places. That's where you change it. Now in this case, there's yet another page. PAT is, I suppose, pattern mode, you might call it. In the documentation, sometimes, depending on what version of the documentation you might be seeing, you might see this being called KCM, Kit Change Mode. It's pretty important. It's one of the project defaults, so you'd save this per project. When you save a pattern, will the kit be saved with that pattern? So at the moment, it's off, meaning you can program all your patterns and when you come back to it, those patterns will just play with whatever kit you happen to have loaded, load kit. If you change this to auto, it means when you save a pattern, the pattern will remember what kit you saved the pattern with. So the kit and the pattern are tied together. Of course, you can still load another kit and play that kit with the pattern. It just means that when you first call up the pattern, that particular kit that you saved it with will also be called at the same time. So again, that's a pretty fundamental decision to make. CKI is clock input. It's in PPQ and CKO is clock output. So they're the hardcore configuration options. Now, if you want to save them, so for example, we, uh, we did change the... pattern recall mode so now it will, it will recall the kit that we saved the pattern with so we'd like to save that so we'll go save project project 0 0 to 63 edit name no I won't bother to do that we'll just save it as the default there it is saving away We've come all this way, but we haven't even created a pattern yet. So let's do that. Shift pattern. Go for pattern 7. Press play. There's nothing in there. Choose a voice. Start with a kick. Doesn't matter what we do. Put in a few things in. Okay, now to save, save project, I always find is the safest way to do it. Otherwise, if you go to another pattern before saving, then that pattern's going to be lost. There's no auto save, there's no way to retrieve it, it's gone forever. So saving project, I find, is always the safest way to go. What that won't do, though, is if, let's say... We've got our pattern and we make a change to the kit. So if we say go to the kick drum and we change the tuning, let's do something really obvious. Sounds terrible, but we love it. So now we go save project. does its thing, we play it, now we're still hearing that horrible kick drum that we changed, and so we might think, oh, we've saved the project, everything's great, we switch it on, we come back the next day and go, oh, I can't wait to hear that fantastic kick drum. Oop, it's not in that pattern though, what was it, six, I think, or seven. Seven, seven. And we go, oh no, what's happened to our fantastic kick drum? 
And that's because we didn't save the kit. So if you don't save the kit, none of those changes are going to happen. But what we can also check, remember when we went shift config, and we went along to pattern auto so that the pattern automatically saves the kit. Let's just make sure that's all happening as we expect. So here's our pattern. Let's go load kit. Let's choose something else. Well, maybe not that bad. Uh. Okay, freak UFO, that'll do. Save project. So we're resaving pattern seven now, the freak UFO kit. If we play it again now, of course. We'll hear it fine. We'll turn it off again. Turn it back on. Loading up. Shift pattern number seven. And there it is recalling our kit along with the pattern. So that's a good thing. Now, we might then decide that is such a wonderful pattern, I would like to copy and paste that pattern to number, pattern number eight. And you have a look along here and there's copy, there's certainly no paste. So what do you do? Well, the thing is you have the pattern up that you want to copy, that's seven. You go, save pattern. And we've got it into pattern eight. Save pattern success. Shift pattern eight. There we go, back to the original, seven. So no copy and paste pattern as such. You just have to save it onto the new pattern number that you want. Now next time, we'll get into some more exciting things perhaps, like editing sounds, making new kits, lots of other goodies. Until then, see ya.